Hey, everybody, you'll recognize this guy on this channel. Alex McCreese is back. Uh, one of the things I've gotten a lot of uh, requests for is a discussion about the OGL, the open gaming license debacle. Um, and Alex is promoting his latest Kickstarter, the Ascendant Platinum Edition, a revised second printing of the core rules of the uh, RPG system that you guys remember. I did a thing about the comic book on Twitch. So, Alex... We're going to talk the OLG, but you have a, the OGL. I keep messing this up because the OLG is our gambling board uh, in Ontario. So I'm like, OGL, you have decided not to use the OGL for any of your systems, correct? Yeah, I'm done using the OGL. Uh, yeah. And in fact, I spent the last three months rewriting my uh, earlier game, Adventure Conquer King System, to remove all of the open uh, game license references and content. Now that's one, a lot of work to a big statement and knowing you, you don't do these things lightly. You don't tend to be reactive. So what's the thinking on that? Well, Wizards of the Coast um, endanger the stability of the license is the short way of putting it. Okay. In order to comfortably build intellectual property around a license, you have to believe that that license is perpetually irrevocable, stable. And their shenanigans have demonstrated that uh, at least a sizable portion of their corporate attorneys and corporate executives don't view the license that way, don't intend to treat it that way. And it's true that they've been pushed back by uh, consumer sentiment in mm -hmm. uh, levels of egregious behavior. Um, but nevertheless, you know, if, uh, if someone comes up and punches you in the face and takes your wallet, and then later the crowd is like, that was the wrong thing to do, you should give him his wallet back. He gives you the wallet back. You're like, well, I still am not going to do business with you. You just tried to take my wallet. So that's more or less in, in very high level terms, the situation for me. I'm just not willing to risk being uh, uh, associated with that license anymore. Now, that's the least emotional explanation I've heard from somebody. You know, they immediately go to the, oh, it's bad consumer practice. They lied. They tried to strong arm people. The fact that you think, and I know you've got a legal background, so I sat up and took notice when you said that, you're basically saying that they've created a system that actually isn't enforceable, which makes, which would make the license moot, wouldn't it? Well, they've created a system where it's questionable what the license actually offers. Right. In, in 2001, um, Wizards of the Coast created the open game license. It was mm -hmm. the brainchild of a man named Ryan Dancy, who was a visionary thinker. He arranged for Wizards of the Coast to purchase TSR. He led mm -hmm. the third edition of Dungeons and Dragons from the business side. And he had this notion that he would make Dungeons and Dragons the dominant game in the ecosystem again by making the core rules available to everyone. And right. then the and what he recognized, and I think he was the first to recognize it, was that tabletop games are uh, networks. And so they benefit from network effects. The value of Dungeons and Dragons isn't just the value of the book. It's the value of the network of people that play it. Right. So by going open game, he felt they could achieve massive network effect uh, and dominate the industry. And he was right. 3.5 mm -hmm. were massively successful. Uh, his method of achieving that was the open game license. Um, which guaranteed a uh, perpetual license to use what was called the SRD, which is System Reference Document, the SRD. So it guaranteed a perpetual license to use the System Reference Document uh, in that product, and as well as in downstream products, provided you included the terms of the license. So for instance, they released the System Reference Document. I use the System Reference Document to design Adventure Conquer King System, and I add some mechanics to it, and then release that under the open game license. And then another person can come and use Adventure Conquer King system and they use the open game license. And so the best practices and the most interesting content can spread through the industry. That was right. the idea. Right. So, um, that uh, served as the, the basis of a, a really great um, buildup of third party content for Dungeons and Dragons for the third edition. And mm -hmm. Now in the fourth edition, which notoriously failed, they did not release the fourth edition under an open game license. They released it under the GSL or game system license. And so uh, a lot of commentators think that that was a strategic error at that point, And that was why fourth edition failed and Pathfinder flourished. 
during that time period. There's there's one reason fourth edition failed because they also pivoted to skill trees with this brilliant idea they were going to dominate video games as well, yeah. right? Or there were there were a lot of mistakes made and a lot of the thinking that you saw during fourth edition has resurfaced now and sixth edition. Okay, you're predicting my questions. Oh my God. Um, yeah. So you're seeing a direct line from the the stuff that started in fourth, the the um quick cash, instant money, as opposed to proliferating, as you said, a network of players that makes it a dominant system and sort of I don't necessarily want to say passive, but it's it's carrot marketing as opposed to stick uh, business practices. Yeah. So yeah. I think it's worth putting it in perspective that Hasbro is a publicly traded company. Mm -hmm. They're looking at this intellectual property, which is very valuable. It's worth $100 million. But they're looking at, let's say, uh, Marvel and how it's made um, gazillions of dollars for movies and video games. Or they're looking at games... Um, in the video game space that have IP that are a 10th as interesting as mm -hmm. what Dragons has, but are making, you know, a billion dollars or more annually, 10x as much. And so from the point of view of Hasbro, if you think of Dungeons and Dragons as just quote, a brand, mm -hmm. it makes sense to say our brand is under monetized and we need to find out better ways to monetize it. And that's exactly what they're doing. The problem with that approach is that it necessarily means that you're going to treat your existing network of players as more or less disposable in the same way that Marvel and DC treated their existing comic book readers as disposable when they decided to go for the bigger fruit of the mainstream. Mm -hmm. And that was a big part of the backlash was they thought they could get away with it and it turned out they couldn't. Right. Now, now Mar Marvel waffles back and forth. Again, you predicted what I was going to say. Part of the reason Marvel is so dominant is not necessarily because they did something right. It's just DC has screwed up in every possible way, including their television used to be completely solid. And now even then, a show like Teen Titans, they're like infected by the grimdark, which people don't want. And it just seems like ironically to invoke a DD spell it's like hasbro warner all these companies got rigid thinking cast on them and they just can't get out of this quarter to quarter short term bad business but i'm not an expert am i right here like am i on the right track i think you're on the right track okay. and definitely there's the quarter by quarter we have to show growth you know, I think it's worth noting that Hasbro has a new CEO who's the former head of Wizards of the Coast. And, you know, typically a CEO gets compensated based on does the stock mm. price go up. And the stock price went up because D&D had grown. So if he doesn't keep growing D&D, that stock price doesn't keep going up. And then what happens to all his stock options? You know, for the CEO, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity to become mega rich. Right. You know, there's, there's all of these bad incentives kind of, you know, uh, uh, baked into the U.S. capitalist system that um, just can lead to unfortunate outcomes. Right. Uh, so, yeah. But that's why we need leadership. And ideally, I mean, this is almost what happened with EA back in the day where they thought people from Clorox could move over and sell games like you do dish soap and you know household cleaners and it, it just didn't work games are a relatively low mar low profit margin industry where you need economies of scale and and real buy-in right you you can't force someone to to have fun <laughs> and so all this you know stick as opposed to carrot stuff that's where i think it goes wrong but there was more to the wizards ogl I said it right that time, story than even that, because then all these stories about preferential deals with certain high profile groups came out. Now, I didn't cover it at the time because I couldn't substantiate anything about it. Have you heard anything about that? Do you have any opinions about that? Because you can say it. I can't <laughs> in yeah. these roles. Yeah, it's, it's unquestionable what happened. Uh, Wizards of the Coast created their new plans. And I think, I think it, it helps to frame what that new plan was versus where they ended up. The original plan was that um, the open game license was being deauthorized. And to make that, they were, they were relying on a one word sentence 
in the original license that said any authorized version of this license can be used. And the, oh, okay. The intent of that clause, according to the person who wrote it, was that they meant to say that uh, if it gets updated and there are terms you like better than the terms you're currently using, then you can also use the later license. You're not stuck with the early license. But it was okay. never intended to say that, uh, uh, it, in other words, the clause didn't say uh, only authorized versions can be used, but any authorized. Any, oh, okay. So anyway, they, they decided to make this legal claim, the basis of their legal claims that they were going, they were able to deauthorize uh, the open game license. Deauthorizing the open game license would mean that every product published under the open game license from 2001 to the present day is no longer to be sold on the market. And Drive Through RPG and Kickstarter had been contacted about that um, and they had acknowledged that, you know, legally speaking, if that was the stance Wizards took, they were going to have to behave that way right. until it got proven wrong in a court of law. Now, so that would, have, that would have devastated um, the uh, the third party uh, community it would have put Pathfinders or Paizo's Pathfinder out of business, et cetera, et cetera, had that been. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, they then softened the blow um, by creating Open Game License 2. And the idea was, don't worry, we're putting the fifth edition under Open Game License 2 and you can use Open Game License 2.0 and everything will still be hunky-dory. Except when you actually looked at the details of Open Game License 2, it wasn't actually an Open Game License at That's all. Right. Open Game License 2 said, one, uh, they own all of your content. Two, they can terminate the license at any time. Mm -hmm. And uh, if they do, they still retain their license that you gave them, but you lose the license they gave you. So it was open, but in, in the opposite direction. Right. It would be like a... a, a a shrink wrap license on your Microsoft Word that says that Microsoft Word owns the rights to your novels. Um, Which Google Drive does do. Yeah, I mean- that, it, is, that is in Google Drive. Like, yeah, uh, uh, OneDrive, Google Drive, technically they own anything you put there. Yeah, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so there was that provision. Um, there was also a royalty provision. There was a provision that you had to report your finances to them. Um, yeah. So uh, very onerous. And it also said you couldn't do um, video games and you couldn't do digital content and things like that, uh, which again, an infrastructure had built up. So that it was, it was the combination of the deauthorization of the original license combined with the egregious terms of the new license that was supposed to replace it that really set things aflame. Um, I wrote an yes. article, I called, it, I called it the perfidious treachery of uh, Wizards of the Coast. Um, and I was, I was very excited to get to use the word perfidious. It was the first time in my life I've been able to. Um, and it, and I, I, I mean, I, I can think I can speak, you know, with a measure of emotion there. I felt betrayed. Like I had. That was the dominant story. And that was the part that caught fire. And that was the part where I'm like, there's gotta be something deeper to this because on the surface, it just seems like this should be easy to solve. You've backfilled the reasons it wasn't easy to solve. There are deeper problems than just, oh, we did bad, uh, we're backing off. Right. You're saying the problem's not solved. It no, sounds like, solved. yeah. And they still have not, so they could solve the problem instantly. All they would right. have to do is say, here is open game license 1.1. We have added the word irrevocable after the word production. That's right. It. Problem is solved. Everyone says the open game license is entirely secure. No one can take it away from us because it's irrevocable and everything is great. They so, have to do that. That, for people who aren't lawyers, um, who that stops the problem of the proliferation to the point that they could possibly lose an IP right. through adaption, adaption, adaption without doing this retroactive, like, it, the Star Wars extended canon thing that people are still angry about to this day that they wiped it all out and it's now the Filoni verse. Have I got that right? Um, I think so. Yeah. The, so legally speaking, there's a difference between a perpetual license and an irrevocable license. Right. Um, so let me give an example. Let's say I give you a license to publish Ascendant comic books for one year. Right. During that year, it's irrevocable. So that means no matter what you do during that year, I can't cancel that, that deal. Okay. okay. 
you know, you could go on the internet and, you know, badmouth the heck out of me and, you know, give the product away, anything you want to do, it's irrevocable. But for one year, it has a term. Mm -hmm. Actual license has a term that is indefinite. It just continues perpetuity until it's revoked. And then what happens to the stuff published under that agreement once it's revoked? So a well-written contract would explain what happens. Okay. You have to dispose of it or you have to, you have 18 months to sell it. And then afterwards you can't, or they might say you continue to print the old books, but you can't do new ones. Yeah. There's a, there's a bunch of deals in in TV where it's like you own the episodes, but I retain the IP. Exactly. exactly. Right. Right. uh, That can be structured in the contract. The problem was that the open game license didn't include any of that. The open game license was written as if it was irrevocable. Everybody thought it was irrevocable. And so there were no provisions whatsoever to explain what happened. And then they decided to revoke it. Oh, so it was a giant loop. It was a giant loophole. Yeah. Okay. They found, they found what they felt was a legal loophole and they decided to exploit that loophole. Right. And they thought that was a good idea with a bunch of rule obsessed tabletop RPGers. I think what they thought is that the universe of tabletop RPGers is no more important to them than the universe of hardcore comic book shoppers is to the success of Marvel movies. Okay, but this is actually game book to game book as opposed to they knew when they started adapting that people going to see, say, Batman didn't mean more sales for Batman. So that kind of made sense to me. This it's really hard to get a new customer into a very expensive, labor-intensive thing like tabletop RPG. You have to maintain that existing consumer base. Well, I think they are they are looking towards a future where tabletop RPGs aren't tabletop RPGs. So if you if you read some of what they've talked about, they're discussing okay. virtual tabletops, um, the elimination of rule books and the replacement with entirely online. Um, content systems where you generate your character online, it's stored online, it's equipment is kept online, it's avatars online, and you introduce the character into a virtual tabletop. And they're also talking about having artificially intelligent um, dungeon masters so that everyone can play D&D all the time without having to wait for a dungeon. They they don't understand the appeal of their own product. I don't think they do because they they basically reinvented video games. They've reinvented ICQ chat games. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, it's not even a video game because the whole joy, to me, the reason I'm I'm both is you can't what core rules a video game, right? right? Like when I first started playing White Wolf and that I got into because they distributed the basic guides for free. They were PDFs that everybody could do and hey, they're yeah. work like a charm. Uh, but we didn't like the com the the mental like the the mental and then psychic. Sc- it, it felt redundant to us, so we just got rid of one. Yeah. Everything went under. Well, you can do that in a tabletop RPG. I can't change the inventory system in Elden Ring. Right, and right. so the future of Dungeons and Dragons is a future where you can't change the system. So it that's be- not what D anD D was built on, though. That's correct, but it will be hard coded into the virtual tabletop and the D and D Beyond system that they're putting together, and um, and it will be a walled garden that they control. So, so they don't understand that the fairly recent resurgence of tabletop RPGs was the very fact that unlike a video game, it's four to six people in the same room at the same time. Right, and I think it's worth noting that this decision is being made after a very anomalous three-year period when everybody was trapped in their homes and right. unable to. And so that gives the appearance that tabletop gaming has migrated to online play because no one could get together to play in person anymore. And so if you simply looked at the market in the last two years and you, you, you pretended you didn't know about COVID, and you didn't know about lockdowns, you would say, wow, the, the rapidity with which virtual tabletop has been adopted is game changing. This is the way of the future. But is so it? It's exactly what they did with fourth ed in video games. Wow. 
And exactly what they did with third ed and intense customization from second. Yeah. Yeah. As as much as sorry, this is really inside, guys, but I'm just like, oh my God, actual answers after months and months of um yeah. So this is off past the screen. Oh, that was that was Scout. Scout is recovering from dental surgery. He's still a little whacked. Things might get a little weird. Oh, yeah, this is a scout. Yeah. Cat attack. Um so this is interesting. It's there's it sounds like there is some sort of institutional issue in the brain trust at Wizard that and Hasbro that just keeps making the same mistake with a different coat of paint. Correct. Yeah. Okay. And They're so making the same mistake with Magic the Gathering as well. Yes. You know, they've Magic they've practically Gathering. killed that after a period where it 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 seemed to be coming up. Mm -hmm. And then they tried to treat it like Pokemon. Yep. Yep. Yeah. 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 So it's definitely that's their new corporate mentality. And if you look at who they've hired, it's largely Microsoft executives. And that's the Microsoft mentality. Ah, uh, okay. Totally own the platform. Now, that's got to frustrate you as point of privilege. I'm going to offer an opinion here. That's got to frustrate you as somebody who managed to be a CEO of a company that, for people don't know, Alex used to run The Escapist, one of the best bosses I've ever had in gaming. Um, but you managed to continue the cool, even if it got bigger and bigger and bigger. And it was just like, you felt it the minute you couldn't do that anymore. Yeah. How, how personal versus how professionally frustrating is this as somebody who managed to brand and maintained the, the spirit of it for so long? Right. Well, I would say if I had been, if I were Gary Gygax or one of the people who had created Dungeons and Dragons, um, or even some of the more recent people that had worked in really making that brand flourish, I would be incredibly frustrated. I would be incredibly disappointed with what I'm seeing. I mean, and, and Ryan Dancy, to his credit, has come forward and said just that and has okay. completely burned Wizards of the Coast to the ground for their shenanigans. Um, yeah. So... And I suspect there's a number of people within the uh, within the organization that feel like was. I mean, do you remember uh, Greg Tito, who you knew from mm -hmm, PSK? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm certain that Greg Tito is privately fuming about what Wizards is doing. He was always a true believer in you know uh, in in sort of you know, the righteous path of game. Yeah, I mean, of all the brands to do this with, they decided to do it with the one where the original creator had his home phone number, so people could call him in the in first edition like ultimately it wouldn't have grown if they maintained gary gygax's vision but sort of the spirit of that connection i think is what drew people to it you know because a D, &D player is not a warhammer player right very different things and warhammer is flourishing mm -hmm. with a very different model They've made yep. it work, but they've been incredibly consistent, right? They own their own publishing house. They have a, a principle of scarcity that makes it almost a, a secret club kind mm -hmm. of thing. People do checklists and, and, and you can talk to three Warhammer fans and get four different opinions about what that world is about, right? Yep. And they have no experiences in common. It's so big. Yeah. It, yeah. Shows, it shows how a different model can work, but they've been consistent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, D and D seems to be trying to run up the down escalator and then complaining they're not getting anywhere. <laughs> uh, I mean, I guess so. Yeah, yeah. the The difference I think for Warhammer is that um, they have adopted a model where they they feel that people come of a certain age, they become really interested in painting collectible miniatures and feeling awesome epic armies. And they have the time to do so, and they have some of the disposable income to do so. And then they kind of just burn through that part of their life cycle right. and they, uh, they move on. And so what they've done is every four or five years, they refresh the rule set, they refresh all the books, they refresh the miniatures. And they do that knowing that the people that are currently playing the game are going to be annoyed because now they have to buy new armies and buy new rule books, and maybe they won't do that and they'll drop out. But their assumption is they're going to drop out anyway. So but then there's an entire different stream of Warhammer fans who only read the books, don't touch the miniatures. Right. That's right. And then there's people like me who played the Space Marine games. Right. 
That's right. And and I was inspired to play it because I interviewed Joe Matt and he just turned into an eight year old kid in front of my eyes, super excited about Warhammer. Right. And then you go and talk to Cliff Blazinski and he talks about the inspiration of Warhammer. Yeah. And yeah. it's this the the change that comes over people. And that used to be D D fantasy nerds too. And it just seems like, and I say nerd as one of them, but yeah. it seems every time they do this, they they kill that connection yeah. people have with it. Because I mean, the thing that's cool about tabletop role playing is it's inherently silly. Like, you know, you, you're sitting in a room full of, with your friends and there's got to be the right group because you can learn things about other people you can't unsee, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but it is silly. It is vulnerable. It, it is very open to mm -hmm. use one of the words in the license. The minute you start making people put walls up and have to really think about protecting themselves, it breaks the spell. Yeah. No, and it's true. Yeah, uh, there was a there was a session I ran at Defy Media when I was um, flying out to Los Angeles, um, and a bunch of the folks were like, "Oh my God, you need to run Adventure Conquer King system for us." So, so, I, so you know, we got together in a in a meeting room and, and played some sessions. And um, one of the things that happened was they cast they cast the spell Speak with Animals and started talking to like the local chipmunks. And here's me, ostensibly senior vice president of games, and I'm role playing a chipmunk. <laughs> you know, if you like, look at that ten thousand foot view. That's a really weird thing to happen. But uh, but in the context of a tabletop game, you know, like I'm the, I'm the dungeon master. If you want to talk to the chipmunk, I will role play a chipmunk. That's my commitment to the game. Okay, but in fairness, but you also tried to get us. Yeah, you also tried to get us a table. At a convent, at a restaurant after a convention, dressed as a dark Jedi, going give us a table in front of everybody. So you know, there, there's an example of it was part of your brand, so you made it work for you, right? We'll have this discussion. There, yeah, there you go. And and so it's like, all right, and 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 this is this is what good managers do. This is what good brand stewards do. This is even what. Disney does with, I mean, the amount of time and effort they spent getting Oswald the rabbit back, mm -hmm. right? It just seems like the the thing I've struggled about this whole OGL um, controversy is how predictable it was. So why did nobody internally go, this will be bad? People internally did. So okay. Uh I can say that I can't disclose who. Okay. But I absolutely know people within the circles of trust, and they were warned, and the okay. warned regarded as the grumbles of old-fashioned uh, nerds who didn't understand the big picture. Oh, okay. So they didn't. They didn't listen to people internally. They didn't listen to people externally. That. That sounds like a panic response from a company. Like that's what a company does when they're desperate for quick money. And so they need to break some eggs. Yeah, that was exactly it. They, they needed to show growth. They decided to break okay. some eggs. They decided to break was, you know, the open game license. But they, they broke the whole carton. And accidentally dropped the whole carton. Yeah. Right. All right. So let's pivot to your system, which you know I love. Um, this is a really cool, uh, if anybody's a fan of the boys TV show and wants to do something with a greater female presence, check out, um, Ascendant Platinum Edition. Now, how are you doing it differently? You, you've obviously had to write your own license for this system. Yeah, so Ascendant is currently not under any license. It's just proprietary to me. Okay. There's a license being developed, um, called, uh, Orc, which is the open role play license that is being developed by Paizo. Once that gets released, my intent is to adopt ORC, assuming its provisions, um, you know, meet, okay. meet requirements uh, that I have. Um, and so at that point, I'll make the, the system mechanics open for both uh, Ascendant and Adventure or Conquer or King under uh, that license or some, some variant of a license like that. Because I do think um, open gaming is, a, is really important. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, as a game designer, could only do what I had done 
because of the foresight of Ryan Dancy and creating the open game license. And I want to respect that. And I want people to come after me and carry on that tradition. And, and you know, and, and if in 25 years, people are mining my books and saying, wow, there were some really genius ideas here. And I'm so glad I could use them. That, you know, to me, that's a, that's a win state. Yeah. So, it's funny yeah. to me. It's funny to me that, that people are doing this. I mean, I guess they don't know their history and why GURPS isn't a household name because they wouldn't let, fallout use the GURP system so they created the special system and the rest as we say is history right wow. you i think we're from the same school is you want people to steal some yeah. of your systems because that means they're good oh yeah i mean one of the funniest things about the business i'm in is um you know there's websites online where you can get virtually any tabletop game you want right. to up on that and a number of my best customers uh, and i'm talking people who drop a thousand dollars on my kickstarters a number of my best customers discovered my game by pirating it and saying, this is an amazing game. And then they backed my next Kickstarter. And in fact, that's one of the beauties of the Kickstarter model for someone like me, which is that uh, I can know I, I've made the game. I've been paid for the game. I've printed the game and, and I'm good to go. And if it makes extra money thereafter, fantastic. But, you know, costs have been covered, profit right. has been earned, and everything after that is gravy. So um, that's why that's why we do Kickstarters uh, for every product. Basically. So that's why you continue to do it just because you find it works. Because, yeah, it's very labor intensive and Kickstarter takes an increasingly big bite. But I guess you factor that in. Yeah, I factor that in. Um, I mean, a good, you know, a good Kickstarter can yield 30000 40000 yeah. on a company. And yeah. of course, you know, sometimes you hit viral, like there's a game that went viral called Shadow Dark that just raised yeah. like a million dollars. Yeah, you can't rely on that though. That's just fluke. You can't rely on that, yeah. but you can certainly you can certainly benefit from it when it happens if you, sure. you know, if you have swings of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you you stand by the the Kickstarter model because I know there's a lot of you know um grumbling about that as well of the oh you've got all these things, why do you keep doing Kickstarter? Blah. There's all this philosophizing about it instead of just going, it's a viable model for people it works for. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. Uh, I don't begrudge anyone who says I don't back Kickstarters. Okay. No After the Kickstarter, I make the game available. You know, I'm, I'm happy to have you as my customer at that time. You know, I totally get Cause, why. Because you put everything on drive through RPG, right? I do. And right. then it also right. goes into Amazon and Noble Night Games and places like that. Yeah. And I get why people don't want to do some Kickstarters because there's been some really shady characters that have done some really shady things. Uh, you know, there's people that have been waiting for, you know, uh, seven years for some Kickstarter products and you just Ten know that. Years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, for me, uh, I think part of the reason I'm able to continue to do Kickstarter is that we already faced our horrible setback. So when we did the Dwemer Mount Kickstarter, it was a, our largest Kickstarter to date, something like $50,000. And unfortunately the, uh, lead writer on that project, um, uh, encountered some really severe personal challenges okay. and um, uh, sort of had to step away, but left us in the lurch in a really bad way. And we ended up losing about $20,000 $20, on yeah. that project um, because we had to replace work. And I had to end up writing another 150,000 words out of nowhere to finish it. Um, but we did finish it. We mm -hmm. did deliver it. We didn't go back and say, hey, pay more. We just got it done. We got it to our pants. So people know that when the shit hits the fan, Autark will deliver, even if it, even if we uh, are mm handle -hmm. both ends. Yeah, a lot of other Kickstarter companies haven't done that, so I get why people are skeptical. No, that that good rules real. I mean, we ran into issues with Song of Sparkle Muffin, where both me and my 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 co dev got long COVID. Yeah, of one way or another, and we've just been communicating, and people have been cool about it because I did two previous ones you know came through and that goodwill is real uh and that i guess goes back to what you were saying about the feeling of betrayal with the ogl and and i guess that informs why you felt so it it, it really is a personal professional mind meld right there is no separation i mean certainly not for me you know part of the reason i went into games in the first place rather than pursuit of law was that it was you know something I personally really loved and I wanted to be in that space. And I think that's true for most folks. Mm -hmm. the, you know, no one, no one wakes up and says, you know, I'd like to make invest investment banker like money by designing tabletop games. Right. Just, 
not a, not, not a, a mindset. Um, you know, and, uh, and always, uh, I've, I've tried to run my businesses from the point of view of, of love of the gamer culture. Mm-hmm. And the- mm-hmm. um, I, who knows though, right? Like I've never been in the situation where I've been running a fortune 500 company with pressure from stockholders. And I imagine that pressure, uh, must be enormous. On mm-hmm. those so I have a measure of sympathy for them because they may well have, you know, uh, they've gotten everything they wished for. And now it's like a monkey's paw situation where they're burning to the ground the very thing they love that got them there. Like, who knows? Maybe mm-hmm. that's what's, like, mm-hmm. I, you know, those pressures exist. They're real. They suck. So, mm-hmm. so ascendance way past its goal with, yeah. with a little bit of time to go. Congratulations. Um, and yet you're still, you know, you're coming on, you're, you're still getting it out there give people a brief summary about what it's about. Cause this is YouTube. People don't read. I can put the link up. They're not going to do it anyway. So let people know what it's about and what kind of player will enjoy it. Sure. So Ascendant is a tabletop role-playing game. Um, that is uh, a simulation of comic book physics. So um, everything in the game is modeled on a logarithmic scale so that uh, every 10 points, you're a thousand times better, uh, such so a normal human might have a, a might of five and then our hero american eagle has a might of 15 and so he's a thousand times stronger than a normal human um and then that uh that mathematics that logarithmic mathematics and that modeling um you know lets us take the game plane to really interesting directions that no other superhero game can do so for instance oh you know you want to try and uh, stop a volcano or you know you want to um, use your radiation control to cure uh chernobyl of its radiation damage all of that can be done in the game. There's a whole chapter about saving the day. Um, and then uh, it's also got um, its own universe, mm-hmm. uh, called the Ascendant Universe, which is um, our universe right now, except that superheroes have just entered the picture. Mm-hmm. So it's not that they've been around since World War II or World War I. There's no prior generations of superheroes. The first generation of superheroes begins in 2017. And how does the world react to that? And um, and so there's a there's a lot of I, I would call it sort of dark satire built yeah. into the game um, because of course uh, we live in in sort of clownish satirical de- decadent times, and I think that's kind of reflected in in how the game plays out. Um, but you don't have to use the Ascendant universe. A lot of folks are adapting it for you know DC heroes, Marvel, anime, etc. You know it's it's a universal system in that for any setting yeah i imagine a dragon ball z setting would go well because power gaming is a feature not a bug yep 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 Yep. there's some guys that are currently working on adaptations for that and having them yeah right where i went to attack on titan with your system i play that (laughs) the system can't really do is um the sort of superpowers that uh have no physical basis whatsoever okay you like if my superpower is that uh, whatever I dream comes true, like the game can't really model that. No. Right? It can model the fact that American Eagle is a thousand times stronger than a human being or that the flash can run at the speed of light, but it can't model, um, you know, something that ambiguous. Yeah. I love that you come on and say what your game can't do because that's the hardest question to get out of a game maker. They never want to say anything different, but you don't want disappointment. You want repeat customers. That's smart. Yeah, I mean, I, I design a very particular type of game for a very mm-hmm. particular type of gamer. You know, um, it's it's heavy on gameplay, it's heavy on simulation, and it's at the opposite end of the spectrum from a rules light story game. You know, there are certain folks who just want a one page set of rules that will guide them in improv with their friends to tell an interesting story. Right. Ask you if they want to play Dungeon World. That's great. I'm glad that there are games for those people. Those are not the games I design. And that's not the audience my games appeal to. Right. You don't want the townies, the puppies, that kind of stuff. You want yeah, the, yeah. I don't want those people to buy my game and be disappointed. So I would rather they know, hey, this is not the product for you. Right. That's awesome. Okay, Alex, I'd talk to you for hours, but your time is valuable. And so are people watching this. Anything else you want to let people know about this project uh, or your company? Oh, sure. So uh, Ascendant Platinum Edition is actually three products. So there's the um, the revised second printing. Uh, there's the Rogues Gallery, which is a source book for oh, games nice. but with villains and uh, adventure hooks. Uh, and then there's the graphic novel Ascendant Star Spangled Squadron, which gives you... Oh, a- 
So you can get you can get any of the three or all three in a bundle deal. Um, so if you've already got the rule book and you just want the source book or you missed the comic book, you can back it. If you don't have any of it, you can buy it all. If you've already got the comic book, but now you need the rule book, you know, there's different reward levels for everything. Awesome. And the comic book's fabulous. So that alone is is worth if people missed it the last time, they can check it out this time. And and on that note, I'll share it here. You'll you'll be the first to hear it. Uh we just are sending the first wave of the comic books to the Simon and Schuster warehouses. It's going to be in bookstores this summer. Mazel tov. Congratulations. That's amazing. It's my first time getting into bookstores that way. That's great. It's a great book. I really, really legitimately enjoyed it. But next up, the Netflix special. <laughs> That's exciting. <laughs> that, that. that would be cool. We'll see. I'm going places. All right, Alex, thanks so much. And uh, link, Great to see you. link in the description box below, guys. Check it out back at There's Still Time or check out, uh, how do you pronounce the name of your company? Autark? Autark. Autark. Check out Autark on Drive Through RPG, Amazon. What was the other place you said it was available? Uh, oh, Noble Night Games. There's Noble Night Games. Okay, Noble Night Games, Amazon, Drive Through RPG. Check it out. Alex, thanks so much. Thank you.